Sakshi. Namaste and good evening to people joining from India and good morning for people joining from the United States of America. I'm Sakshi Sharda, a researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Samsthan, Nai Delhi. And I extend a warm welcome to you for IMPRI, hashtag Web Policy Talk. We've gathered here for a special talk by Dr. Emily Reins, titled Negotiating Informality, a range of policy needs and problem-solving strategies in urban slums. Under our series, IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, hashtag uh, uh, City Conversations. Moderator for our City Conversation series is Dr. Somnadeep Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Professor Bharti Santi Niketan, and a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI. He also coordinates the Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies at IMPRI. I would now request Dr. Samadeep Chattopadhyay to take the proceedings further. Thank you, Shakshi, and uh, a very good evening to all of you from Kolkata. Uh, uh, just before starting, let me just give you a brief background of uh, the City Conversation series and today's talk. And in this City Conversation series, we have been engaging with the urban issues uh, in India, and we have been inviting uh, the experts both from India as well as from abroad to discuss all those issues. And uh, today's discussion uh, is mainly on uh, the slums. And as we know, the slums or informal settlements have been recognized as a global challenge for some time now. And in India, uh, slums represent a mode of urbanization almost equal in significance to urbanization occurring through formal processes of planning. And we all know that uh, there are issues with data definition and uh, non-inclusion of the settlements in official data on slums. Uh, if you just look at the census 2011 uh, data, then it shows that 65 million people uh, stayed in slums in the country, which is roughly about 17.4% of urban population in the country. And uh, the conditions of life in the settlements are uh, characterized by insecurity and disparate vulnerabilities, for example, evictions. And that too, uh, despite years of existence and efforts to consolidate their footholds in the city and uh, languages of encroachment, uh, illegality, and then unauthorizedness. This create an extremely complex relationship with the institutions of the state and the city politics. And uh, slum dwellers, they resort to the varieties of informal practices to gain access to the city resources and popular and patronage politics, award of selected benefits. Uh, we have seen that they have, these have often resulted in conditions of living that are not just poor, but uh, uh, see very little improvements over the years. And essentially, so it is important to understand the nuances of these informal practices in terms of, uh, for example, their nature, uh, their purposes, their mechanisms, and finally, the outcomes in terms of spatial and social development. In today's presentation, uh, Dr. Emily Raines uh, plans to discuss the diverse political strategies that the slum residents adopt to solve their problems. And also, she will touch upon uh, some of the coping strategies the slum residents have been adopted to combat this uh, current pandemic. And uh, today's uh, the title of her talk is Negotiating Informality, a range of policy needs and problem solving strategies in urban slums. And just let me just give you a very brief introduction of our uh, today's speaker. Uh, uh, Dr. Rain will begin as an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at uh, Louisiana State University in the next month, and her research interests include in uh, the urban policy making in developing countries, primarily uh, in India. And in particular, uh, she is interested in how the residents of urban slums they mobilize politically and how this affects the neighborhood development outcomes. And uh, she has very recently completed uh, her PhD in public policy and political science, dual PhD for, at Duke University, and. Uh, prior to beginning her doctoral studies, she worked for two years at ID Insight uh, based in Bihar. And uh, so this is the introduction of today's speaker. And apart from that, we have a very uh, eminent panelist today. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Mohalaya Chatterjee, who is the Professor of Department of Economics and Center for Urban Economic Studies, University of Calcutta. We have with us Dr. Jania Mukherjee, who is the Associate Assistant Professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Science, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And Mr. Arvind Unni, who is the thematic lead 
of urban poverty at Indo Global Social Service Society in New Delhi. And uh, we are also with us Dr. Saroni Khatua, who is the researcher at the Center for Urban Economic Studies, University of Calcutta. So, uh, uh, so now I'm just requesting uh, uh, our today's speaker, uh, Mr. Emi, uh, Dr. Emily Rains, to start her presentation. So it's over to you, Dr. Rains. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. So I assume everyone can see that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to, to present today. Um, I am going to be summarizing some findings from a couple different projects that I worked on over time on urban slums in India. Um, and I'm gonna talk in particular about, oops, I think I'm gonna skip forward. There we go. I'll be talking in particular about some work, work that I've done on the wide range of living conditions across urban slums, as well as some work that I've done to explain differences in political strategies, the political strategies that residents draw on to mitigate some of the vulnerability that was just discussed. And then because it, I did say in the blurb that I would focus on the implications for these, the former work on the ongoing effects and coping strategies that residents, slum residents have been um, experiencing and turning to during the pandemic. I realized I wouldn't have enough time to touch on all of these things in this presentation. So I'm highlighting here that I've put a bunch of slides on the pandemic in the appendix. And we can, I'm happy to talk about that in the discussion and the Q&A, but I'm gonna focus um, the next 25 minutes on some of the work I've done describing the range of conditions and explaining differences in, in um, behavior across slums. Okay, so as was just very eloquently you know, discussed, uh, we all know that one of the ongoing and growing global challenges, so the world over, to inclusive development and inclusive urbanization is the prevalence of those living in urban slums and in particularly the extent to which they're dis this pop these populations are disconnected from important resources that we know are crucial to human development outcomes. And so the United Nations estimates already that nearly a billion people live in urban slums around the world and that this is numbers going to continue to increase as urbanization increases. And they define slums as areas that have limited access to property rights, so insecure housing rights, as well as inadequate service access. And in, the, in India in particular, in India alone, they estimate that over 100 million people live in, under these conditions. Also, as mentioned in the introduction, um, we know that slums are, are neighborhoods that not only experience high levels of poverty, but also multiple forms of informality or multiple disconnections. So in particular, the slums are characterized to varying degrees um, by the, the lack of access to secure property rights or formal housing documents, as well as adequate municipally municipal provided infrastructure. So those are things that factor into the United Nations definition of slum area. Um, but slum residents also often lack identity documents, those necessary to access benefits like rations, um, despite living in the city for decades at a time. Um, we also know that most slum residents work in the informal economy. So they work tend to work in positions that don't offer government benefits and can be very precarious with respect to um, wages as well as to, um, job security. And so each of these aspects makes life in slums vo very volatile or insecure. Um, Residents don't necessarily know day to day, right, whether they will be evicted, whether or not they're going to have access to adequate water, whether they'll have be able to access rations needed to supplement their diets or whether, you know, they'll be able to, to get enough work. So this makes life in slums very volatile and insecure and leaves residents highly vulnerable to, to shocks, making it not only difficult to um, to experience upward mobility, or but also really susceptible to downward shocks and downward tugs consistently. And so I mentioned that the United Nations estimates that over 100 million Indian citizens live in slums, um, and which again, they define as an area that is characterized by at least, at least one of five different indicators. Um, 
inadequate access to safe water, inadequate access to sanitation, poor quality housing, overcrowding, and insecure um, tenure, insecure property rights. Um, but in part because the Indian government adopts a stricter definition with minimum numbers of households required to constitute a slum, and also because of bureaucratic ambiguity, infrequent updating, for various reasons, the lists of those living in slums are uh, incomplete. They omit many people. And so again, as was, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, an official, a recent official estimate by the Indian government is that 65 million Indian citizens live in urban slum areas, whereas the United Nations has this at tens of millions more. So there's severe undercount of those living in slum areas. And unfortunately, much of the undercount is omitting the most vulnerable of these settlements. So in order to better understand the living conditions and policy needs across slums, one thing that I or one project that I've worked on over time with colleagues over several years is to look outside of official data sources to try to build our own sample of Indian slum areas. And so we actually use to do this satellite, we use satellite images. So we turned to an out manual analysis of Google Earth images. And we started iterating between looking at Google Earth images and conducting ground truth verifications to come up with a list of criteria that are visible in Google Earth images that can be used to locate slum settlements. And so we did this in order to try to develop our own sample that we consider to be representative of slums across three different cities, Bangalore, Jaipur, and Patna. And so here what I'm showing you is a settlement in Bangalore. And this is a settlement that on the left from, from the ground that it has the residents have been living in the city for decades, but this is not documented in any official data source. And then on the right, I'm showing you that settlement from the sky. That's the Google Earth image where it's actually very easily detectable. And so what we found through this iteration over several years between looking at these images and conducting ground truth verifications is that there are five characteristics that are visible from Google Earth that are predictive of an area being a slum settlement. And in this image, you can actually see all of those characteristics, which are that it's highly crowded, it's haphazardly arranged, so it's not built around a clear grid-like structure. There's no shadows, which indicates that the buildings are very low, they're not tall. And the roof, uh, there's, sorry, there's no roads was what I was gonna say. And then also the roofs are a distinctive color because of the material here, they're made from tarp and that's very visible in this image. Now, we were able then to identify a wide range of, of settlements across cities that look quite different as well. So I mentioned that there are those five characteristics that we find that are predictive of an area being a slum settlement. But while the settlements like the one I just showed you or the one on the left here display all five of those characteristics, other ones like the one on the right are also slums, but don't display as many of those characteristics. So this one, it has different color roofs. Um, it looks like there are roads present. It's, and so there are fewer of those characteristics visible. This slum is a bit more well off, but we're still able to detect that this is uh, in a regular settlement. And so over time, we mapped a, a wide range of these settlements identified through the images across these three cities that I mentioned. And we selected random samples in each of the cities that preserves the spatial distribution of the slums throughout the city, as well as the distribution of these visible characteristics from the images, so that we could select a sample of slums that, again, we believe to be a representative sample of the characteristics of the slums in each of those three neighborhoods. We are sorry, excuse me, of those three cities. And so we then went into those settlements over several years and conducted over 9,000 household surveys asking about settlement histories, asking about pol um, policy priorities, local needs, and the, and the strategies that residents draw on to try to uh, improve or reduce, reduce vulnerability in their neighborhoods across more than 200 slums in those three cities. I've also conducted in-depth interviews with in-depth in structured interviews with 150 slum residents, and we've had many more conversations with um, 
you know, informally with residents. And then we've done a couple follow up studies that are were focused on specific specific inquiries, like uh, we did something on housing markets in Bangalore, and then we've done some follow up work looking at the effects of the pandemic. So in order to first try to understand the range of policy needs across these spaces, we actually at first applied machine learning techniques to all of that household data that we've collected to try to see if slums seem to cluster into distinct types or distinct groups that might have distinctive policy um, needs. And we actually found that rather than clustering into distinct groups, we found that slums across these three cities were uh, ranged ac across a incrementally improving continuum of living conditions. So we didn't find distinctive clusters of slums, but instead we found that living conditions improved incrementally along a very wide ranging continuum. And what I'm showing you here is just the score that we created to quantify how well off these slums were relative to one another. And so what we did was we looked at the United Nations indicators. So the water quality access, the sanitation access, the durability uh, of housing and, and crowding, and then created an index with these indicators to just rank or to, to quantify how well off that slum was. We called it the slum score, which is an index of those indicators. And all I'm showing you here is just the slum scores in increasing order. So this is just to show you that there are no huge gaps in, in scores. What we're seeing is continuous increase pretty much in, in these slum area, in these slum scores. But there's a couple things I want to point out in this figure that I think are important. The first is that the living conditions associated with different parts on this continuum are quite dramatically different. So for the bottom quartile score, for the bottom quartile slums, the average um, or 10, sorry, not the average, but we find that from the household survey data, only 10% of the households in the bottom quartile have cement roofs, these sturdy roofs about 13% have said that they have access to toilets. And when we ask about a set of 20 common assets, on average, they own less than four of them. When you look instead at the top of this continuum, you see a very different picture. So in the top quartile, actually, the we find that about 80% of households have cement roofs, about 80% have toilets, and out of those 20 assets, they hold over eight. So what we're trying to capture here is that the living conditions vary quite substantially across this continuum. Another uh, thing that I want to point out about this figure is that you can see a little bit about the difference in distribution of living conditions across cities. So Bangalore is listed here or is shown here in blue, Jaipur is in red and Patna is in green. And so you can see that slums in Patna tend to cluster along the bottom of the continuum. They tend to be less well off relative to the other two cities. But interestingly, there are slums at the very bottom of this continuum in Jaipur and Bangalore as well. So the distribution of conditions is different across the cities. And then across this continuum, I want to highlight as well that these different types of informalities that I mentioned, so the quality of housing documents, identification documents, services, and the type of work residents are engaged in are also um, quite different. So you would see more at the, at the bottom of this continuum, uh, much greater informality or uh, disconnections from these different types of resources, and these are increasing across this continuum. So I want to transition now a little bit to talking a bit more about politics in these spaces. Um, existing research shows that access to these resources, so as I just mentioned, housing documents, identification documents, municipal infrastructure, can be intensely political. So here I'm citing a couple people who are noting that you know um, these the infrastructure. If we're thinking about water or sanitation, it can be prohibitive 
prohibitively expensive for slum residents to self-provision. Some of these other resources are impossible to self-provision if you're looking at trying to get access to a ration card, a government document. Um, and so in turn, lots of scholars have discussed that urban slum residents will be left to politics to try to um, negotiate with politicians to try to access these types of resources in the absence of being able to self-provision them. And so I like this quote from uh, Gabby Crooks Wisner, who says, access to services in this sense is best understood as a matter of who can extract them from the political system. It is, in other words, a matter of who makes claims on the state. So I think it's really important then to study political behavior in these spaces to understand who's then better able to access some of these important resources that are missing in slum areas. Now this, what does this look like in urban slums? Well, often the political strategies that residents draw on to try to negotiate for improvements and re improve resources are described as collective so often um, described as groups going to politicians or leaders to ask for resources in their community targeted at the community level, so group level coordination. They're often described as mediated, meaning um, many slum, meaning that slum residents will go through a local leader or a broker who will liaise on behalf of their neighborhood and or liaise between politicians and their neighborhoods to negotiate for improvements to the area. These are often called the informal leaders or brokers of the area. And that a lot of these negotiations are described as transactional as well. So the idea being then that that leader would say, if you give us X, we'll give you our votes. And this is what's often described as vote banking, right? The idea that the idea being that neighbors would agree on a material resource or a material good to prioritize and um, have an intermediary meet with politicians on their behalf and offer to exchange their votes in return for that good. And this is something that's well documented in academic literature, but also something that's just discussed and described by the slum residents themselves, right? So here's here's a quote from a um, slum resident in Bangalore who says, well, the vote bank here is the main thing. If we vote for Congress, they'll listen to us. If we approach them with problems, they get it done. They remain the same during elections and after the elections. If we approach them with problems, they get it done to the extent possible for them. So this discussion of this type of collective mediated transactional exchange is quite common, um, is quite common overall. And a growing body of research looks at the neighborhood characteristics that are associated with receiving a favorable response from these types of requests. So there's some work that shows that state support tends to be extended to the neighborhoods that have stronger informal networks. So they're more organized, they have denser social networks, they're more organized or cohesive at the neighborhood level, but also might have denser networks of these brokers or informal leaders or these more efficacious informal leaders. Pause to take some coffee. Now, this these studies though tend to not discuss differences in whether neighborhoods are making requests at all or how they're doing so in the first place, which we should expect also to affect, of course, which neighborhoods are getting what. So there's not as much uh, work looking at whether and how slum residents are making or entering into these types of negotiations with politicians. And this is something that in studying a wide range of slums over time, I found that whether and how residents do turn to politicians to negotiate does vary substantially across settlements. Here I'm again showing you um, two different settlements where I have conducted interviews in in Bangalore. The first one on the left is the one I showed you before, which is ha, has been there for 20 years, but um, is not documented in any official lists. And there, residents actually largely do not make claims. They don't engage in these political strategies to try to negotiate as a vote bank. Uh, instead, they, they say, well, we can't really do that when we ask them, why, why don't you go negotiate for, for water, et cetera, they say, well, we're not part of the city. The city dwellers get those facilities, but our people don't. And so there's there's abstention in that neighborhood from, um, from making these demands. 
On the right is a different neighborhood that actually formerly looked a lot like the one on the left, but was over time selected for in situ upgrading. And there, residents describe, describe themselves as these adept political negotiators and describe this very systematic process, this you know, systematic vote bank process, where they say, well, they start the process 15 days to a month before the election. And then the people here come together as a united front and say, here's all the things we want for the, our area. If you can get them done, we'll put our vote for you. And in this area as well, other residents or residents have talked about also um, going around their area leader in smaller groups and asking for more individualized services. So quite different story between these two settlements. And explaining why we see different uh, strategies and behaviors engaged in across settlements is something that I've been working on in recent research. And so something that I've been looking at recently um, is, so something that I, so this is something I've been looking at recently and what I've been arguing or what I argue is that slum neighborhoods vary or are characterized by two important dimensions that can explain quite a bit of the differences in the strategies that residents draw on to negotiate for improved resources or reduced informalities. And the first is their, their access to formal resources. So here I'm on the X axis showing neighborhood formality. And here I'm referring to the same dimensions that I've been discussing throughout this presentation, which is uh, whether or not and the extent to which the residents have access to housing documents, to identification documents, to government provided quality infrastructure, and also to the types of occupations that residents tend to work in. And so there's a big spectrum um, that there's that whole continuum of, um, of the degree to which settlements are connected to these different resources or the extent to which they're in, um, accessing these formal resources, which I think is one dimension that, that I'm going to be talking about. But then another dimension that's important for understanding which strategies residents engage in is the strength of their informal networks. And this is something that I mentioned other people have been studying for quite a while. So here I'm referring to internal neighborhood cohesion, so co cohesion amongst the neighbors, but also the presence and, and strength of um, the informal leaders, as well as the informal leaders' connections to politicians externally. And so I'm arguing that these two dimensions affect um, neighborhood priorities. So what goods or services residents are going to prioritize trying to negotiate for, as well as political beliefs, and then as well as the extent to which neighbors are um, encouraging one another to mobilize. And in these three ways, these two dimensions shape the political priorities that, that or excuse me, the political strategies that residents turn to. So at a very high level to show you what I mean by that, I'm showing you here what I believe the relationship or what I find the relationship between this neighborhood formality and, and political behavior to be. So on the X axis here, I again have this neighborhood formality variable. So this is, uh, this is a big spectrum of the degree to which residents have access to those various resources that I've mentioned, services, documents, et cetera. And on the y-axis, I have uh, the extent to which they're engaging in, on this curve, group level strategies, and in this curve, individual level strategies. So what I mean by that is the group level strategies, are they do engaging in this type of vote banking behavior where they're going as groups, often through intermediaries to make demands either by protesting or by offering to exchange votes for, for the good, but participating in this group level or in, in this group often through the neighborhood le leader is what I'm referring to there. The individual curve, what I mean by that is the whether or not residents are going directly either by themselves or in smaller special interest groups to politicians or bureaucrats to negotiate for specific sub neighborhood level resources. And so what I'm showing you here is that at very low levels of neighborhood formality, so where there's no documents, no services, and workers are employed in extremely precarious occupations, I find that residents, slum residents actually have very uh, limited political efficacy. So they tend to describe that they do not 
they do not have confidence that they would be able to approach the state and ask for these various goods that they want, but they also don't believe that the state will respond even if they go. So the political beliefs or the political efficacy is quite limited and engagement is, is depressed as a result. And that really is describing what's going on in the settlement I showed a few slides ago, where they say, well, you know, we're not, we're not the city, we're not going to try for that because they're never going to respond to us. At higher levels of neighborhood formality over here, we see higher levels of collective efficacy. So at, in these neighborhoods, residents are much more likely to say that they feel confident going as a group, going as a neighborhood, or going through their leader, their local leader, to negotiate for goods. And they also are much more likely to believe that if they do something like that, not only are they capable of it, but that politicians or the state are going to respond favorably. And so, that's one mechanism. Another is that at this level of resources, residents still have need for or use for boat banks to, to negotiate for collective goods. So things like connecting the whole settlement to piped water or drainage. And so as a result, you see these higher levels of this group type of organizing in, in these spaces. And then at these very higher, this much higher level of neighborhood formality where slums are um, very, beginning to look very similar to lower middle income, um, lower middle income neighborhoods that are perhaps indistinguishable from slums, as you get at that higher level of formality, you start to actually see an increase in residents' individual efficacy. So that's when you start to see residents describing that they believe they, by themselves or in smaller groups, are capable of um, confidently engaging with the state, going directly to um, politicians to ask for subgroup or special interest goods, and be more likely to believe that the state might actually respond to them. And so between that and having already met many of the collective group needs, um, you start to see a, more of a shift towards individual or subgroup level strategies. Now, adding in that second dimension of the stronger informal networks, what I'm essentially showing here is that for a given level of neighborhood formality, areas with stronger informal networks where there's greater neighborhood cohesion and stronger and more efficacious leaders with stronger connections to politicians, you're going to see the group level coordination, this protest or offering to exchange votes for, for goods type of activity shifting upwards. And that's in part because collective efficacy is also higher in these spaces. People are more people in these in, in neighborhoods with stronger informal networks are more likely to expect a favorable response from politicians as well as to expect their neighborhoods capable of, of um, making an effective uh, claim. But also you're more likely then to see neighbors encouraging one another or mobilizing one another to participate. And one other thing that I want to point out here is essentially what, I, what this graph is also showing is that for very low levels of formality, these informal networks are pretty much a prerequisite to the area engaging politically. All right, so I think this is important because whether and how residents negotiate with the state or demand, um, make claims as Gabby Crooks Wisner says, uh, try to extract these resources from the state, uh, whether and how people do this is going to have implications for which places and which residents get which type of goods. And so I you know, just talked about this, what I think is going on here that these two neighborhood characteristics are shaping political beliefs whether residents are mobilizing one another and the types of uh, goods that they're prioritizing in ways that shape the types of claims they make on the state or the demands they make on the state. Then of course, once one decides whether and how to engage, the state's going to decide whether and how to respond. And so there's going to be this feedback loop where depending on how the state responds, the neighborhood is the neighborhood characteristics update at the next period and you enter into this feedback loop. And so something that I'm working on right now and in some of my ongoing work is looking at unpacking this feedback loop in order to try to better explain development trajectories across different slum areas. So to summarize, um, you know, as was mentioned in the introduction, we have we there are severe data deficits on an undercounting of slum residents and much more information is needed on an attention to to slum areas. Absolutely. 
But we also know, and what we, I've worked on over time and just presented at a very high level, is that the living conditions in urban slums and the level of disconnections that they that residents experience varies substantially across settlements and actually varies more across than within settlements. In the absence of, of access to adequate supports or adequate resources, informal political negotiations that residents um, turn to to try to access these different resources are very important to understanding um, who ends up getting what, but whether and how residents actually do mobilize very substantially across settlements. And so I think this will have really important implications for development, again, at the household and neighborhood level, which is something that I'm working on um, showing more, more fully going forward. So I'm going to stop there. I think, like I said, I um, left, I, I have some slides on some work I've done relate recently on the pandemic and would be happy to talk about that in the discussion or of course, much more detail on any of these high level um, projects that I've just presented. But thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reigns for your very interesting uh, presentation. Yeah. Absolutely, this is a very important topic that uh, uh, the research that you are carrying on this Indian slums. And as you uh, started out your presentation that uh, the multiple informalities uh, that characterize the slums in India, and of course that we know very little about the slums and their informalities. And uh, you have shown that uh, the living conditions of the slums, they vary quite substantially along the continuum and among the cities surveyed which you have surveyed, the three cities that you have surveyed. And also uh, you have highlighted that the slum dwellers, they explore uh, the different political channels uh, to make claims on the urban resources, uh, which are missing or inadequate in the slum areas. And you mentioned about the, uh, this uh, sort of political clientelism, which are extremely important uh, in helping the slum dwellers to make their claims to the urban resources. And there you mentioned about the importance of the neighborhood characteristics, as well as the characteristics of the slum dwellers themselves. For example, you have talked about the lack of proper documents and how they are uh, affecting or shaping the political power to negotiate with the uh, leaders or with the state uh, in order to claim their uh, resources. And also uh, you have mentioned uh, that the neighborhood uh, formality and the strength of informal networks, how these two important dimensions shape the political strategies that the dwellers are undertaking. So, and uh, it's very nice. In, in, there is a very interesting graph and where you sh uh, have shown that at, uh, at a lower level of informality where slum dwellers without having any documents, they also lack political efficacy. So of course, and that's make their conditions much more vulnerable. They are the most vulnerable section of the pop of the, among the slum dwellers. So, and 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 also you have mentioned that the uh, the stronger informal networks, uh, and from there you uh, the importance of stronger informal networks or the presence of influential leader at a, a specific given level of neighborhood formality that critically also shape the livelihood conditions of the slums and. Uh, it's really important. So now, uh, thank you again, once again, for your very interesting work. So I have some uh, of my queries, so I'll place them later on. But before uh, uh, that, just to take uh, uh, this discussion forward. So let me now request uh, our discussion uh, to uh, comment on your presentation. So uh, may I now request uh, Professor Mohalaya Chatterjee, if you, ma'am, if you please come and share your thoughts, yeah. Uh, thank you, Shomodeep, uh, for including me, and thank you, Dr. Rains, for this interesting talk. Uh, actually, I uh, would like to uh, point out two or three things. Uh, this is a very interesting thing, and you have surveyed three Indian cities of three different type of characteristics, Patna being in Bihar in one of the most least developed states, and their slums are... Uh, quite different from what can be found in one of the most advanced states of Karnataka in Bengaluru. And Joypur being a uh, middle ranking, uh, Rajasthan is again a backward state, but uh, Joypur being its capital and Joypur having some historical uh, uh, historical importance and uh, being a tourism state, the slums are quite different of that. So I'm not going into that. I uh, would like to point out two or three things. Actually, I come from a city in which 
the slum networks are most strong and not only today but from a long time and that has of course that has a history behind it uh, because here the uh, so called slum uh, uh, politicization and the networking started long ago hmm. long ago maybe uh, just in the 50s hmm. in the 50s so our uh, experience with slum networking networks their political negotiation the the strength of their political negotiation is quite different from what can be found in other indian cities but uh, it should be pointed out that you have rightly pointed out that uh, when the uh, the slum dwellers are in a difficult state when their uh, their formality condition is very low uh, and they are not in a state to negotiate and others uh, but here uh, uh, i would like to know from you that what is the status of the slums you have surveyed uh, because that is the main point of contention in indian uh, status uh, data system or anything uh, here we have three types of slums uh, the, the, the registered recognized and identified the registered are recognized which uh, which uh, you have actually pointed out that some uh, slums do not come under any official record hmm. so those are the slums which we know that they are slums and only the census authority uh, count them count them again with their own uh, uh, set of parameters as identified slums the slums which come under recognized and uh, recognized and uh, uh, and uh, uh, registered they are basically which are recognized by law uh, one is by the central law central slum clearance law which was passed way back in 1956 and other is by the state laws uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, 2010 there was a project which was related to this rajiv avas yojana uh, which tried to make india slum free or zero slum city by uh, 2020 and now we are talking about in 2021 about the informality the networks and other things in uh, uh, for indian slums and uh, 2011 census data shows that there are slums once upon a time it was thought that slums are supposed to be some intermediate sort of things where poor people the migrant from the rural areas they come and stay there uh, they come and stay there and as their income increases they will go on to some formal housing hmm. but 2011 census data clearly shows that that is not the scene that is not the scene the, the, all the cities and towns over every size class they have slums and in some smaller slums uh, we are ashamed to have about 30% of people 30 to 40% of the people in the metropolitan cities like uh, Delhi, Mumbai, and uh, and Kolkata living in slums, but some of the smaller towns even have ninety to hundred percent of the uh, of their population living in slums. So it's a matter of shame. Uh, and the point is that why these people have to negotiate, why they have to uh, build up uh, so-called informal networks to get their due. They are citizens. They are citizens. They are uh, they are entitled to. entitled to have all the facilities of the citizen hmm. of the citizen and the pandemic has shown that they are the main labor force of the city hmm, which uh, which do all sorts of sort of uh, informal works uh, informal jobs which are necessary for the ongoing of the city hmm. ongoing of the, this is this is really deplorable that they have to go for this type of things uh, i would just end up by Uh, at least for uh, this uh, i would like end up by saying the some of the uh, some experience from my own city as i have said that we have a, a very long history of uh, uh, building networks and others uh, you know calcutta or kolkata uh, faced uh, something uh, after the in 1947 when the country was partitioned uh, there is a huge flow of refugees from the Uh, so uh, at that time is pakistan and when they came of course the pressure uh, most of them came it's not that they came to kolkata only but most of them came to kolkata and there was a huge pressure on the 
uh, on the land in and around Kolkata uh, to accommodate this refugee population. Uh, and at that time, at that time, most of the owners of the land for these slums, uh, for these slums, they were, uh, they took, uh, wanted to take that advantage and they wanted to wanted to eradicate all these slum dwellers hmm. and there is a long history in 19 uh, and there was a slum clearance act was centrally passed in 1956 and in 1958 uh, 1958 it says uh, the west bengal government the west bengal government they wanted to um, implement uh, that law in kolkata also hmm. uh, they of uh, they did not mean West Bengal because other cities and towns in West Bengal at that time did not have those much of the, that much of slums. Uh, and there is a and uh, when this slum clearance act was being discussed in the uh, in the uh, in the our legislative assembly, West Bengal legislative assembly, there was a procession of more than five thousand people from the slums towards the legislative assembly towards the legislative assembly protesting against uh, against their uh, eviction and all those things uh, that was the first time that not only individual slum dwellers but all the slums in the uh, in the city of calcutta at that time the city of calcutta uh, they came together to protest against this slum clearance act uh, that is the first time and that is how and they also fought in the state election under this uh, under a, for a banner called United Citizens Forum. So way back in 1950s, they claimed their right as the citizen. Hmm. Citizen. Well, after that, uh, after that, uh, say many years have passed, and there was the Kolkata Bosti Federation, Calcutta Bosti Federation, but that, that was not that active. But they were reunited again as Calcutta Bosti Federation in uh, in this uh, 19. Uh, 1979. 1979, the Calcutta Bosti Federation was reborn, uh, and uh, of course, uh, that was being held by the uh, the left wing government that was in power at that time. Uh, I'm not going into that long history, but just to say that this uh, Calcutta Bosti Federation it took a major role in lots of legal negotiations and lots of uh, uh, lots of other issues uh, at one time uh, this uh, as you know the kolkata metropolitan development authority it was a pioneer in uh, in the in situ development of slums rather than going for slum clearance and uh, demolition of slums they going for in situ negotiation and each and every slum of kolkata at that time there was a there was a uh, smaller component of this Kolkata Bosti Federation, and they did the negotiation with uh, CMD authorities, CMD authorities. And uh, uh, I remember, I remember attending two or three meetings in late 80s or early 90s uh, with the KMD of officials. Uh, I remember, and there I would like to bring in another point that is the gender point. Uh, when we looked at the uh, looked at the females in the slums they were the most vocal about their problems they knew everything the which tap is not having water which drain is clogged and everything hmm, everything so that is another dimension and i was surprised i was then of course somebody coming out for university without very uh, not much ground level uh, experience about these things i was surprised at the conviction with which these female bosti dwellers spoke with the kmd officials came the officials and of course with changing times uh, changing times their role also changed uh, role after they uh, also built up some sort of data with the maintenance of the slums hmm. uh, the KMDA could renovate the slums but they took no responsibility for the maintenance and others that part was taken up by uh, this branches of this Kolkata Bosti Federation and one of the very leading roles i should say and their network is spread not only in these recognized and uh, recognized and the so-called registered slums but also uh, in the so-called identified slums and in the very recent days uh, uh, say in the last part of 2019 or 2020 uh, when this uh, we have a bridge very important bridge connecting the northern part of the city with the suburb 
that is the tala bridge the tala bridge was uh, planned to be uh, uh, planned to be demolished because uh, it lost its uh, it was thought to be lost its uh, yeah, so, so and this tala bridge uh, below this tala bridge uh, there are about 1000 people uh, living in an unrecognized slum and in this bosti federation by that time they had, it has changed its name it's no longer called the bosti federation but it is Poshimongo bosti unnoyan Shumiti. it took a leading role in, in uh, arranging the rehabilitation of almost all the households all the households all the all the people living there living there before the demolition could take place hmm. That is one sort of uh, that is one very important example, uh, and this uh, and this Poshimongo Bostuno and Shumit is now not confined in Kolkata only. It is spread to in each and every uh, uh, municipal uh, statutory town in West Bengal. So this is one of the one is something I say that not only negotiating about their daily needs uh, like water, like uh, uh, like drainage. Uh, like light within the slums, then the streets within the slums. So one of the point of uh, slum improvement was uh, having paved roads within the slums. Not only all these things, but also this uh, this fight against the eviction. That was also part of this networking and others. So I should stop okay. here. Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, making uh, some interesting points about the some fundamental points rather i should say that the regarding the right to the city uh, who are the uh, citizens and uh, if they are rightful the citizens they have the right to live in the city so they do not have to uh, resort to this kind of political clientelism uh, just being a citizen they should have access to all the facilities which uh, they should enjoy to enjoy uh, to to a very decent uh, life so well thank you i think uh, uh, dr rains will respond to that but before that let me uh, just have all the discussions point of view so that it will be easier for you to respond to all the points which have been raised by your discussion so uh, now let me just move over to dr genia mukherjee uh, uh, yeah. for so, yes for your uh, uh, comments yeah it's over yes. to you dr genia thank you shomodip sir thank you maula ma'am and of course thanks a lot dr emily for this very nice uh, presentation and you know it was quite lucidly explicated so i could really understand that you uh, kind of you went through a lot of data you also developed your own data sets which i think i would uh, appreciate a lot uh, because like for example uh, all of us know that uh, that slums uh, remain undercounted there is uh, i mean no confusion on this fact but the way you use the methodology i find your methodology to be quite innovative because I think you have kind of uh, triangulated, you, you use the word reiteration, but uh, I think I would also be happy to use uh, triangulation, triangulation and also maybe cross fertilization of methods and methodology, which is actually my favorite as well. So what I like uh, about your methodology is that how you have used uh, Google Earth, so GIS, uh, innovative GIS maybe, and then you have uh, kind of fed the data uh, from the field finding. So kind of you have uh, combined uh, this GIS with quantitative data set, uh, I, I, I guess so. So this uh, I think is quite uh, interesting, but what, so two complementary uh, questions or comments uh, uh, in terms of this is, one is uh, after, you know, uh, seeing your presentation and listening to your uh, key points, uh, I feel a little provoked to again, kind of complicate the ontology of slums. So what are slums exactly? So how do we also, you know, make this differentiation between slums and squatters and busties? Because there are some indigenous uh, terminologies as well. So for example, uh, if you also see, because Indian, the Indian context is so very diverse and complex. Uh, so like, for example, uh, so what we mean by slums, is it absolutely, you know, uh, or, or, or is, can we really use busty? So is busty a kind of a replaceable term? Again, I think I, I came across a report, which is uh, an interesting report uh, by Nitai Kundu, again on Kolkata. And uh, this was published in 2005. And this was on slums versus quarter. And there he pointed out that, you know, slums, their tenurial security is still even more uh, uh, kind of uh, secure, better secure than the uh, tenurial security of the squatters. 
because by, uh, by he made the distinction on the basis of you know uh, uh, of 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 um, access to land deeds so for example he said that you know uh, for uh, the islam population uh, this this the households they actually had land deeds with them uh, which so for, and it made uh, the uh, jo job of the statecraft uh, difficult uh, if you know when the state actually wanted to kind of implement this displacement or eviction rights against uh, the uh, implementation of any development project for that matter but on the other hand you know the squatters people so they kind of uh, lacked access to land deed for sure but they had the voters card so it is absolutely uh, assured that you know they of course were used uh, in this vote bank politics so they were of course part of this vote bank politics and this is nothing new because you know uh, we of course know the uh, works by uh, joseph gugler and mike davis who talk about how you know these people actually have been uh, used uh, as uh, pawns uh, in this uh, in this entire politics on vote bank so i would also like to know from you you know uh, this uh, ontologies uh, or uh, how do you actually you know uh, define slums and how do you differentiate between slums and squatters and other indigenous terms that you have actually uh, come across while doing uh, this survey on these three cities and i'm sure that uh, information on these three cities also uh, make your position stronger because you then uh, can make some typologies and you can uh, you do some you can you are better positioned to do uh, or to engage into comparative uh, research or comparative uh, ontological understanding so my final uh, my comment uh, is like, uh, 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 I mean, of course, the, the, the points or the arguments that uh, came across, uh, that, that came up in your presentation uh, about infrastructural um, uh, injustice, maybe. So you talked about infra lack of infrastructural access or issues relating to infrastructural access. I think I can be more straightforward to introduce the term injustice and say, you know, of course, infrastructural injustice. And when I use injustice, then definitely I would also maybe uh, would like to know from you or maybe inform you uh, with, would like to inform you with the, with the like environmental justice or political ecology literature that is there. That actually talks about this, uh, uh, this lack of or, or, or uh, un, um, unequal distribution or unequal access to uh, urban utilities uh, for that matter. So I think political ecology uh, scholarship, uh, or the recent uh, urban political ecology scholarship, especially on Indian cities, it's really uh, like, uh, it's quite comprehensive and it has developed so well in the last 15 years. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to go through works uh, by especially people like Malini Rangarathan, because Malini Rangarathan talks about, you know, these water mafias in Bangalore. I'm sure you must have come across her work. And apart from Malini Rangarathan, I think there are there are different other works as well. But I think Malini Rangarathan uh, can be the most appropriate because you also you are also concentrating on uh, Bangalore. So just the final thing is that you know I also enjoyed like Shomodip said I enjoyed your graph and uh, you know this uh, you talked about because it was quite clear and evident the uh, formal informal. Uh, but you know because you address the formal informal intersections and uh, so i think again there is a literature on on um, uh, infrastructural injustice by urban scholars uh, like adriana allen and uh, karen becker on architecture uh, infrastructural archipelagos uh, uh, where they show that where there is lack of uh, policy driven initiatives how needs driven initiatives are actually uh, you know kind of images in these urban spaces. But then this story also needs to be, get complicated because if we say that, you know, where, where there are lack of policy driven needs, uh, there are needs driven uh, initiatives, th but that does not solve the problem because it is important to uh, map in details the uh, intra, uh, you know, power asymmetries, even within Islam. And, and, and this entire story of power asymmetry or power hierarchy is also very much gendered. And uh, there are, you know, of course, class, class, um, caste, ethnicity, gender, these are all the various uh, dimensions that also need to be taken into consideration when we uh, are, uh, you know, we are kind of focusing on even one slum. So each slum, I think, has its own narrative. 
So I think your uh, study is very provocative because it kind of uh, unpacked so many questions uh, from multiple avenues. So all the best. And uh, yeah, I think I'm looking forward to your comments. Uh, Thank, on you. This point. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Genia, for uh, some making some very uh, interesting and fundamental points. Like, and absolutely. And another, just to add to you, whatever, whatever you have uh, said, like, uh, if you understand, if you want to, we we want to understand the informality in the context of uh, the Indian slums. Then I think another uh, way of looking at informality is to uh, a state of deregulation, uh, which is very much important because informality in the Indian context is very much fluid in nature. Fluid in nature in the sense uh, it is a kind of ever shifting, like uh, uh, relationship between what is legal and what is illegal. Because just Dr. Genia has talked about the power asymmetries. And that is gendered nature of power asymmetries, the uh, and how the power asymmetries are also shaped and informed uh, by caste, uh, religion, and also religion is also also a big factor. So, so, so depending on all that, the entire idea of informality is also very much free. That means, uh, uh, from one point of view, from one perspective, it uh, one one specific uh, uh, approach may be considered as legal, but from the same uh, for some other person, at uh, that may be considered as the illegal okay so it's a completely fluid concept so so that's so so it, it, it may be informality we can think of a state of deregulation that might be uh, an useful framework and also you have talked about uh, Genia, dr genie has talked about many other things and another important uh, 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 theoretical uh, aspect might be the occupancy urbanism by solomon benjamin so that might be the very much useful concept for understanding the vote bank politics uh, which you are talking about. So, well, so well, so with this comment, let me now move over to uh, uh, Mr. Arvind Uni, uh, who has the experience of uh, doing some very good on good research. So she, he has been researching uh, for the very uh, uh, la, for the last couple of years. So it's over to you, Arvind, uh, for your yeah. comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Somudhi, for the for the for the introduction. I'm I would be commenting on the wonderful. Uh, research that Emily has done uh, from more of a practice side also and uh, also as someone who's who's dabbling with research every now and then again so uh, and some, um, some and some pointers for us to also think over and 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 uh, uh, think and reflect on such a very important subject and uh, a topic that, that you've selected so firstly my there are four, four or five comments uh, to, to initiate the discussion comments slash questions to you and we can take them up as we kind of go along. So um, uh, I've been working with uh, slums and the issue of informal settlement for the last around 10 years now with, with communities and, and I'm speaking from that experience. Uh, might be differing from others, so yeah. So first is that the the approach of um, what, what triggered and what was very interesting also is the approach of beginning with this research of how you look at uh, informal settlements and that too to use a Google uh, earth image which uh, can be very tricky and it is something that when we uh, are working in the community is something that we usually don't do uh, why so is look at look at bombay uh, uh, during rains in mumbai most of the houses will have uh, plastic on top of their uh, top of their top of their roofs look at kolkata so to look at slums from their aesthetics and to then enter that it's a slum that can be really challenging because the point that Somyadi uh, just mentioned before I kind of got in is uh, that that there is very little distinction between what is a slum now and what was a slum yesterday and what is it going to be tomorrow. So uh, if we were to apply the definitions of slum being uh, something that's not habitable I'm sure 90% or 95% of Indian cities would qualify as slums. So, uh, so the, the whole debate of looking at uh, informal settlements and then to kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, initiate the, the whole inquiry was, was very interesting, but something that uh, was, was little, uh, very, very interesting uh, to begin with. So that was the first uh, point that I had to make and a very brave kind of decision to take also. So I would be very curious to know, Emily, of why did you kind of went into that? Second point was that, that I think when you select different cities and, uh, and contexts, what really happens is that like, again, referring to what Genia said just before, is that every settlement is different. 
and when you do it at a scale of selecting three cities and very very different cities uh, that becomes really further complicated because you have different set of policy parameters and you have a different set of uh, policy i won't say policy you have a different set of polity uh, in in that city the politics of kolkata is very very different from what happens in delhi it's again very different from what happens in bangalore so what really complicates matters then is that the slum may be 20 years old but if it's if it's in if it's in a city like delhi and if it's come about even in 2015 uh, or just after 2015 that might not be uh, legal but if it if it were bombay uh, so so there are these different cut off dates there are these different land owning agencies that have different cut off dates so there are these different parameters that are wholly dependent upon many many uh, uh, many many conditions that determine why the settlement is the way it is uh and politics i think plays a major role because uh, in spite of all the movement that uh, professor ramalaya made i don't think that west bengal as of now has a policy or a or a or a framework to 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 give land or to give uh, uh, land titles to informal settlements in west bengal ma'am you can correct me if if i'm wrong but this is from what i've heard and experience but we know that slums will not be evicted and demolished in west bengal because that is the polity there that is the politics uh, uh, that is very peculiar to west bengal at least at this stage we don't know what will happen in future so those that was my that was my second point third is that uh, that that every community is different and the probably the reasons of other than ones that you mentioned of definitely informal networks play a huge role in how how the community develops uh, who lives there what is the caste composition uh, what is the religion uh, factor there and more more so religion right now because our experience at least my experience in in communities has showed that uh, that slums used to be truly secular yeah yeah so now they are not because now you see ghettoization in slums also it probably used to be there but not to the same extent of of how let's say middle class or upper middle class or well off in our society are ghettoized slums used to be secular but now you see that they are not and that determines what is the service that you get or not yeah similarly with caste so so if a slum is 20 years old and they are still living in plastic uh sheds that you mentioned most likely they could be migrants most likely they would be people from elsewhere most likely they could be people even from you know i mean as they say it could be people from uh, bangladesh because they have lot of minority communities working there and 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 they do not get services they do not get uh, uh, any any of the improvements that that we are wanting howsoever collective they might be they will not get those services if there are these uh, these tags that are associated to different groups they will not get that so that's a very interesting and a very very important parameter to assess and study before we kind of go ahead last point was of uh, of of uh, second last rather because if you if you place give give these cities uh, without uh, showing the the data and the research that you've shared i would automatically say that bangalore anytime any day would have better services uh, better amenities and infrastructure because one the politics there is very different uh, caste identity is very solid and and there has been a huge movement of of uh, dalits uh, in acquiring land titles in 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 acquiring improvements in the community and it's actually one of the very few states where you have a very good housing policy uh in in and 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 a very good guideline to give land titles to informal settlements and that's come about by uh, uh these uh, in, informal settlements and groups coming together and and negotiating at a state level so uh, uh if if you were to share that uh, that graph i would have placed bangalore on top patna would definitely be on this on the on the bottom part because the engagement there is is uh, very different at this stage so Uh, if i were there i would have made those choices last comment was that that we there is there is this gradual improvement of informal settlements and communities that we expect right but 
increasingly more so i don't think that is that is applicable in indian cities anymore so the shocks that you mentioned are becoming more frequent and shocks are becoming bigger in scale so even if it's a 30 year old community which has land title or maybe has more proof or infrastructure they are still getting evicted and that i can give many examples of why because local politics does not matter if you're a corporator you mean nothing i mean for a corporator a slum eviction means a lot but most of the decisions are not being taken at the corporator level urban governance is almost dead in india it's being done at state center and and elsewhere so uh, that is the scale that we are operating right now uh, schemes uh, like smart city if my slum uh, or the community that i live live comes as slum in a smart city god god save the community no because even if i have all the proof there is no way that that will that will stand that kind of developments courts again again the whole uh, so basically there is a collapse of vote bank politics so to say so what was relevant 10 years ago 15 years ago is not what is there at this stage that is that is our our take on the ground so uh, those were some points and 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 uh, questions emily i think uh, it would be very good to kind of hear from you on that thank you so thank you thank you thank you avin so the questions are uh, pretty much provocative so i'm sure that Emily will have ample time to respond to that. So let me not add anything to uh, your comments. So uh, just uh, move uh, straight forward to uh, our uh, next and last discussion, uh, Dr. Sharoni. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sharoni, actually, uh, well, actually, the benefit of uh, speaking last is that most of the points have been raised. So <laughs> it's like uh, I will start with the formality and informality. See, whenever we talk about southern cities. It's, it, it, informality is overwhelming now. It's not only about in slum, but outside also slum. That's it. It goes parallel with the southern cities. But uh, my experience of uh, researching in slums is mainly confined to Kolkata. So, uh, looking at the history, what the Professor Chatterjee was saying, I doubt how far the slums the notified slums those slums which are notified by some acts we can tell them as an informal settlement yes they are a low income settlements they are settlements the bastis the boshoti which comes from the term settlement itself but how far we can say them as a formal uh, informal settlements and that's where the ontology the context of ontology of uh, uh, professor jinia mukaji comes in that that what is a squatter settlement there is a difference we have always always studied as is that something squatter settlements the illegal eh? and then there is a basti the slums which are notified or recognized but but these terms notified recognized identified these comes from when the when the first uh, slum survey slum enumeration was done slum census was brought out in 2001 but the history of slums or the basti jhuggi jappis goes far back so that is one thing that that because we talk about informality which is a very fluid concept fine but at the same time we also need to know about the formality the formal things so that is one thing that but with that also i want to know that how far even if they are formal how far they are safe because what just before me uh, arvin was speaking out even if they are formal settlements they have legal titles or they are actually very uh, strong legal uh, enactments that will stop them from evictions we are what we are saying because of this uh, uh, global corporatization and there is a land grabbing there is a change in this legal entitlements also they the laws itself are changing like uh, thika tenancy act it has been a very landmark act of protecting against eviction in west bengal in calcutta that law is itself changing that law is not being uh, abolished or thing but the internal structure of that law is changing so that is one thing that once we are formalizing we are saying okay it's legal we have also see what remains legal anymore or even if the legal uh, structure itself the ontology of the legal is also changing or not because during the pandemic we have seen there has been lo lockdowns and things like that but at the same time there is there has been uh, much focus on uh, how to govern the slums because immediately it was like the slums will spread everything 
so it came from that kind of fear so it islam became focused but itself it we also seen there are lots of eviction drives which are also going on simultaneously that work did not stop so that is one thing the second thing when we i'm when I, let me continue with the informality like you have said raise the topic of the informal networks how they negotiate that is very important and relevant but at the same time i was thinking of how the local leaders the local state because these local leaders by means the local state that is local self government itself push forward for a very informal kind of network it is not only the slum dwellers who are actually pushing for the informal networks it also for the the local leaders because somehow that even after 25 years of 74th constitutional amendment act and legalization constitutional constitutionalization of the local self government the state government has emerged very strong as far as the urban is concerned so this local representatives they push strongly because that is how they survive i am staying saying this very particularly because when the pandemic happened especially in west bengal it was also awaiting two very crucial election one is the state election the other is the local self election the local self government election the municipal election election is still awaited so whether you will win or not how much you will get because that slum is a very i mean it's a seat of vote banks vote bank politics is very important in this case there are some the ward coordinators the ward uh, representatives some of them have been ex exceptionally responsible exceptionally because they know by this is the time if they push for these kinds of networks if they push benefits this uh, through this kind of network they will survive in fact there was a, a from the chief minister that uh, if if you can if the local uh, representatives can make the mla elect the mlas of their own party they will get certain extra added benefits if you can't you won't get that this kind of things these actually push they also go through that kind of informal network that's why even if a single neighborhood had Two to three slums. One is notified. The other is on on the railway lines or on the canal banks, which are not notified. They make it a point that these kinds of benefits, at least for now, they reach. But the fact is, these benefits are short-lived. I mean, you can give access to some kind of services like uh, like water supplies, or you can add construction of two or three more toilets and things like that. but they don't actually help in uh, working conditions of the slums whether they are living in a formal slums whether they are living in a squatter settlements and things like that this is one thing i was thinking of when i was talking you when you are talking of politics it the politics is not it's some it's a both ways i mean it's not the only about the slum dwellers it's also about those the local leaders local representatives how they play that politics and something like that and uh, especially in states like west bengal and things what you were talking of uh, transactional it's, we will talk about the uh, vote banks it's about it's not only about politics it also also about the party politics so it's when the some benefits is reaching to the slums even if it's a soap even it's a uh, some kind of sanitizing uh, things it is not reaching from the state it's reaching from the party so which party is giving what kind of benefits and things like that so that part is i find very interesting how that dynamics plays out and the second thing is regarding you have taken three cities from three states that is very interesting because they are very different states uh, as already told by professor chatterji but i was also thinking if you could take up the slums of uh towns and cities or the smaller cities of the same state like in west bengal everything and everything is visible as far as kolkata and kolkata metropolis is concerned what about those smaller cities or the smaller towns they are not as visible they are they are i i bet they are more vulnerable because they are less visible and what happens to those so if because you are going for a comparative approach both jaipur patna they are state capitals all the three and bangalore is a very well off i mean it's a, it's a good a, a large metropolitan area but i was thinking of other city, towns smaller towns in Mahar, uh, karnataka or in rajasthan what kind of dynamics what kind of vulnerability on informal networks just plays out i was just curious to know that 
and this is the only thing okay fine uh, can i add something yeah. it's working ma'am mm -hmm. ma'am ma'am if you uh, please Huh. Very, very brief and quick point. Very briefly, very briefly. Yes. Two talking minutes, ma'am. Yeah, talking about networks and others, there is a study by Professor Arup Mitro. It is about four cities, uh, Ludhiana, Mathura, Ujjaini, and Jaipur. Uh, Jaipur is there. And there he talks about the uh, nexus between networking and tasks. Uh, and, and he said that the so-called uh, STs and STs, they, uh, they could get much less from the network as can be availed by the general caste. Hmm. General caste, that is a very interesting point. Uh, usually we think that the people in the lower rung, they want to, they want to congregate more, they want to network more. But uh, this study shows just the different thing, that the general caste, they, uh, they get more from the, uh, from the networking in the slums. Oh, so well, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, now uh, Dr. Emily has a lot of questions to answer. Uh, oh, well, just before uh, moving over to Dr. Emily, uh, I'm just seeing some very interesting uh, questions which is there in your uh, Q&A box. The first one is related to the measurement of uh, these uh, strength of informal networks and negotiations. So these are very crucial. Uh, so it is written that, is, it, is that based on the outcome? So this is uh, question number one. Second question is, Another important question, the role of land developers in all these political negotiations that you were talking about, because uh, I can uh, remember the very influential work of Lisa Winstein, uh, which is on the Mumbai. Uh, there was an, uh, uh, an urban entrepreneur, Mukesh Mehta, how he navigated the entire uh, political uh, scenario to, to shape the uh, reformulation of the Dharavi. And so that's a very important question. And the third one is again, so this is the classic uh, text uh, article by Ananya Roy that's on informality. So how uh, does your research look at slum and informal? So these are three very important questions. Now it's over to you uh, to answer to all the uh, queries and the points which have uh, raised by our discussion. It's over to you, Emily. Well, thank you all so much for an incredible set of questions and discussion points. Um, where are we, how are we doing on time? I'm wondering how long I should no, respond no, I think, for. <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's up to you. Like uh, if you want to answer uh, all the questions or, or rather you please choose the questions that you okay. want to answer. Okay, yeah, because I was I was taking a bunch of notes, you probably noticed. Yeah. So I'll try to I'll respond to what I can. But yeah, th this was a fascinating, incredible set of, of responses. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I think that a lot of theme, a lot of the themes that were touched on were common and um, let me kind of go through my notes a little bit and um, speak to, to the ones that I've thought a, lot, thought a bit more about. Um, all right, so, so I think one thing that came up quite a bit was on defining slums, defining informality and these different categories and how these, these different categories will also differ across cities. So there's a few things to say about that. First of all, it was raised that these cities are going to be completely different in some ways because they have different policies. And I wanna highlight that that's absolutely correct, right? There's a very clearly delineated policy in place in Bangalore for how slums are supposed to become notified and be, and after becoming notified eventually get property rights. Now I say clearly delineated because the what happens in practice and on paper are different and I'm happy to talk about that. But then you look at Putna and there's, there's no slum policy in Bihar. And so of course, then you're going to have a very different set of understandings about what property rights even mean and what you're negotiating for. Um, so I, I guess I'll say that we chose these three very different cities on purpose uh, so that we would have a broad range of cities to look at with a broad range of slums. And at the time, we didn't know whether we would see different types of slums in different cities, whether we would see some sort of continuum like this. And really, the goal was to just select three very different Indian cities and see when we use this type of satellite approach, what do we actually find the range of needs are and, and, and dig in, keep digging in from there. And what I showed you really intentionally kind of loop, lumped everything together because we were trying to make a more general, was trying to make a more general statement about slums span this type of, this range of conditions. And I wanna make some somewhat generalizable statements about the ways in which people experience and respond to informalities across these spaces. 
that was intentional. I agree that every slum in every city is different. And to really be able to perfectly explain behavior and, you know, living conditions, you have to dig into the, into much local, like much more local level detail to understand. But for the current goal of, of creating a broader set of conclusions about how people experience and respond to informalities, we kind of wanted to zoom out a little bit. Now that all said, I have done a bit of zooming in on certain topics. And so we, I actually have a paper that will come out soon that might be of interest to some of the panelists that specifically looking at how slums in Patna are a bit different from the other slums. And it was mentioned in the introduction, I lived in Bihar for two years actually, so I have this tendency to keep wanting to study Patna slums, even though of course they're going to be different from slums in these other cities. Um, but you know, they're weaker property rights, um, there's extreme history of land conflict and tension. There's history of landlessness among lower caste groups. I mean, there's a there's a lot that's unique to Bihar and also not unique that um, we write about in that paper. And so, I guess it, what I'm getting at there is that to some extent we want to have a generalizable discussion about informality spanning this important spectrum within each city the spectrum of informality is going to look different. So maybe it's easier to get water access in one city and not the other. Maybe it's easier to get property documents in Bangalore where there's a clear policy and not in Patna. But we intentionally lump them into this index to try to just get it first. How are people responding to informalities? Some work will dig deeper into the, um, the local conditions like the, the Putna paper that I'm looking at. Another project I'm thinking of starting is looking at actually across these three cities, I expect the I expect vote banks to matter to differing degree or the, the relationship between the strength of a vote bank and access to quality water to differ depending on the city. Um, and so that's something that I wanna then dig into. Well, in Bangalore, the water is provided by the state. It, there's different water provision levels versus state versus municipal or mixed across three cities. And how does that affect then how locally politically mediated these are? So I'm kind of rambling. The point is to say we intentionally pick these very three cities to make generalizable claims, but you could always dig in deeper and deeper to these very idiosyncratic differences, which I do think are very important. And if you were to create a city specific index, it would look different in each place, if that makes sense. Um, on the point about the different types of slums and what do we even think slums are. So I kind of gave all that backstory because that's going to also differ by city, right? So one thing that was puzzling to us early on was that we weren't really finding correlations between notified slums in Bangalore and many other different outcomes. So there's some literature that says you know, notified slums or these when there, you know, there are slums that are there's these three types of slums, those that are completely off the lists, then there are these um, identified where the, the government will be aware that they exist and they're documented somewhere, but they're not legally notified as a slum. And then at least in Bangalore, the terminology is there there's notification. And if they become notified, then that's when they're legally um, supposed to be provided with services and can apply for individual property documents. But we just weren't finding correlations, robust correlations between notification and service access or these property documents. And so we actually did an in-depth study in Bangalore where we tried to, we looked into this further and we, we did a housing inquiry where we looked specifically at all the different types of housing documents residents showed us that they had. And we were able to find 18 different housing documents prevalent in the slums in our sample that we could arrange along a continuum of bestowing more or less security or tenure security. So there were these type one slums that, or sorry, type one papers, we call them type two and type three and the different types uh, and each of those 18 papers could be clustered within those three types and the three types were increasing in the amount of security that residents um, believed that they had protection from eviction, as well as the um, were associated with higher property values in the informal transactions that were going on. But these are supposed to be provided, um, you know, like I said, along this very clearly delineated um, process where 
one type of paper is given before notification, but then the notification process would begin and you get the next type and only after notification do you get the final type. But we see that this is really happening out of order, depending on the local political connections of the settlement. And so even in a place like Bangalore, where you have a clear policy, um, where the, what happens on the ground appears to be very much um, negotiated by the local in, informal networks, but also um, not necessarily or it, it does require some local knowledge to understand then, because it was confusing that we, we didn't see necessarily uh, that notified slums were the ones with better services. We do see that those with higher paper types have better services, but you don't necessarily get the paper types in order of how the process is supposed to go on paper. So in terms of these different types of slums, registered, recognized, identified, um, kind of stayed away from looking at those different categorizations because I think there's just so much ambiguity and, and complexity on the ground in, in reality. Um, speaking then to then though, what are the differences between those and what I'm considering as, as my definition of slums? Um, so we actually, because we wanted to get around the formal data or the official data sources, what we did was we used the, the satellite images to locate essentially look at the physical characteristics of certain areas right and so we could like i mentioned we can see whether there are roads we, we can see the housing um, size materials we can see these physical characteristics the un has these five indicators that they use as as these to to denote or to, to locate a slum area anywhere around the world and those are as I mentioned, have to do with whether or not the area has adequate water, sanitation, whether the area is super overcrowded, whether the housing is durable, and then tenure, uh, whether or not they have property rights. So the purpose of using the satellite images was essentially to get at those, the, those four of which, which are physical, visible characteristics. And then when we ground truth, we went and asked about property rights. So we asked when we were building the sample, we asked about whether or not then they did have those, um, those infrastructure characteristics, but also do most of the people in the area have property documents. And it was based when we were ground truthing and picking our sample, it was based on both, it was based on those UN indicators of both physical deprivations and whether or not residents lacked um, on, on whether they largely lacked these, these property documents. So we were then agnostic to whether we were calling them squatter settlements, whether they, we were considering them as you know, notified as, um, we asked about those things certainly, but when we were building the sample, it was just based on these physical deprivations and do pe most people not have property rights. And so what we end up with then is that when I show that continuum, I, I'm really glad that this was asked about because when I'm showing that continuum graph, that includes what would be considered squatter settlements, as well as what would be considered rehabilitated slum areas or notified slum areas, because we're spanning essentially any area that has these physical deprivations of overcrowding and uh, poor quality housing, lack of water and sanitation, and where the residents lack doc, um, individual property rights. So the, the settlement might be notified at the group level, it might not be. The residents might be considered squatters, they might not be. But then that way we capture that wide range of living condition, or we, we capture the, the range of settlements that just have those deprivations um, recognized by the United Nations. And so I think it was really important then to clarify that, yeah, some of those, many of those are going to be undocumented because many of them are going to be smaller squatter settlements that wouldn't be counted by the census because they might be less than 300 people which is like the minimum cutoff according to the Indian government, right? So the point of that spectrum is that we're going from the most vulnerable squatters all the way to settlements where I, I showed a picture where there were apartment towers and that's a rehabilitated uh, in, in situ developed slum area, but residents still consider themselves slum residents. They have documents that say it's a slum. And this gets into what some of the feedback was as well, was, well, when does that become a formal settlement? And I think we need to we I think that's somewhere that that's a little bit blurry, like the, the upper end of that continuum does start to blend into formal, but perhaps lower income areas. And we're really trying to get at that 
the, the lists when they do exist need to be updated so that slums eventually get removed when they no longer experience one of those deprivations. But um, that we're getting kind of on that continuum all the way up to those that would be just about um, should be taken off the slum list essentially. All right, let's see. Um, I wanted to, because I was just talking about the satellite images also get back to the point that it can be really tricky to use Google Earth. So this note here. I think here I wrote down in my notes, this is exactly why we need to triangulate. So absolutely, um, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable using the images to say, here's a map of slums in the city without then also asking people about, like I just said, we, we, property rights or double checking that that's not actually, you know, something that just looks like a slum because, you know, it turns out there are, you know, markets that can look like slum areas. Um, outside of India, actually cemeteries I've seen in other cities when I look at images, they look like slum areas. So, you know, definitely you can have some false positives when you're using the satellite images. And I think that that's absolutely the, um, we're not at a point where we can just use satellite images to understand slums at all. And I don't know if we'll ever be, but I think it is a good tool to try to at least start to locate those that are perhaps otherwise undocumented in a systematic manner to then go in and have these more detailed discussions. Um, so I do think that's important to point out and different cities look different. So Patna, for example, where some official estimates are that only 3% live in slums. Actually, the whole city, when you look at Google Earth, is, is pretty much looks like a slum. It's hard to differentiate because the city is so dense and um, in many places unplanned. And so, yes, there are differences citywide in, in where you can actually determine what looks like a slum which also gets me thinking about and to respond to some of the points about, well, what about smaller towns, um, which are, I'm glad that those were raised, that, 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 was, that people brought up smaller towns because most of the urbanization going forward is going to occur in these smaller town areas where I suspect we will see a lot of people living under these slum type conditions, but there will be a different politics. And I'm glad that that was brought up because I think that's a really important area for future work. We have not done any surveys in these smaller town areas, and I suspect that it'll be harder to locate distinctive slum areas from satellite images in those spaces, and that there will be different political negotiations and more neglect, but that's something that I think really needs to be studied, especially going forward. Um, let me see. Another thing that I remember coming up quite a bit is is um, identity within the slums. So caste, religion, gender. So yes, I want to speak about that a little bit. So interestingly, so yes, cat. So first of all, um, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes are overrepresented in all of the slums across the three cities rep relevant relative to the um, demographics of, of the city in non-slum areas. So uh, that's obviously no coincidence. Um, but one thing that you know, we've looked at religion and caste in, in looking at, um, at least in how areas are organizing and not found systematic differences in the quantitative data. I think where we would find really important differences is in who gets responded to, um, which neighborhoods get more favorable responses or not based on my like interviews. So, you know, caste comes up a lot in the interviews. You know, I, in some areas, you know, I'll hear people saying, well, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're Dalits, so they're not going to, they're not going to do that for us. Um, caste has also come up in, um, somebody mentioned, I think, uh, caste activism in Bangalore, and that actually has also come up quite a bit in interviews where I've seen um, caste advocacy organizations coming in and helping certain neighborhoods organize, which has actually led to an increase in the strength of the informal network and has set off a trajectory of political engagement. So I think there's a lot um, to under, there's a lot more to learn about both when do um, perhaps coalitions potentially form across different neighborhoods, which could potentially happen in Bangalore where I'm seeing this, I'm seeing a bit of um, caste coalition uh, protests, for example, like neighborhoods protesting together organized by certain um, neighborhoods that I haven't necessarily seen in the other cities. I think it's important to consider who's responded to, like I said, and I, I mentioned that 
work that I'm doing now is trying to understand this, that part of the feedback loop. So not just how do, you know, after people organize who's responded to, and I think cast will be very important there. Within neighborhoods, I actually haven't yet picked up on important differences in who is um, like, served by the area leaders. And so Adam Orbach and Tarek Thatchell have a bunch of work where they're actually writing about how in urban slums in India, you see a lot of um, cross caste, inter caste coalitions because of this type of vote bank politics where it serves the neighborhoods to work together uh, or it serves different caste groups to you know mobilize together. And it doesn't serve the area leaders and brokers to discriminate against caste groups because they, they build a following based on a broader reputation. So that's something that's pretty interesting to, to follow. And I, I do have one paper where I'm looking at um, which neighborhoods are better organizing. Um, so which ones are more likely to have this social cohesion. And I don't find differences. We don't find that areas are less socially cohesive when they're more diverse, but the, the difference we see areas that appear to be weaker vote banks or less organized when there's greater economic inequality between caste groups. We don't see that when there's economic inequality in the neighborhood or when there's diversity in the neighborhood, but when there's inequality between caste groups, it seems to exacerbate and make more salient caste identity in a way that's making uh, mobilization in those spaces um, that's hindering that. So, so those, so there's a lot of interesting things to look at with cast, and uh, some of them I think are contrary, perhaps, to expectation, which is what Tarek and Adam's work is really getting at. Um, but I, I haven't found. Um, I, I think I'll find more when I look at who's getting a response on. Gender. This is also something that I'm very interested in, and this is something where I see more of a difference within neighborhood and who's who's getting or who's active and who's being responded to or not. I have another paper where I look at women's differences in men and women's political engagement within slum spaces. And someone mentioned that actually women are, um, yeah, I think it was, it was uh, Professor Shatterjee mentioned women, it surprised her how women were very vocal in some of the slums that she'd um, been to. And th this is something that I have, um, found that women and men participate at equal rates in slums when they're engaging in these types of vote bank behaviors. So when there is a, a leader organized protest or when they're asked to um, like sign up, sign petitions to give to politicians that really are, are the purpose is to maximize or show the size of this vote bank or the strength of this vote bank, women are participating at equal rates, at least when you control for other characteristics like education levels and such, which women tend to be um, less privileged on, but they are much less represented in the informal leadership. There's way fewer female brokers. So these area leaders who negotiate um, are tend to be male. They're very heavily male dominated. The internal meetings where uh, leadership decisions are taken are heavily male dominated. And then in, in going outside of the neighborhood in choosing a group of representatives to go make claims, that's also very much a male oriented activity. So that's something that I, I'm quite interested in as well and, and really interested in understanding whether female and male leaders take on different tasks. So again, that's come up in interviews, but I haven't been able to look at systematically in the in the quantitative data yet but I have heard in some interviews um, people talking about how female leaders when they're present will help more with issues of domestic violence or child marriage in ways that I don't hear people talking about male leaders working on so I think there's a lot to unpack there as well let me take a look at my other notes These were really great. I think another point that I wanted to have the opportunity to touch on was there's this, you know, this point again of, you know, some residents are citizens, they have the right to the city. And, and one thing that I wanted to flag was that's something that really uh, amazed me when in my interviews 
uh, was the diversity with which or the variation with which people referred to themselves as citizens of the city or not. So I kind of mentioned that in, in one of the, I mentioned that in some of the photos I showed earlier in the presentation, that in this very informal neighborhood, residents were describing themselves, despite having lived there for 20, 30 years, as not city dwellers. You know, they said, well, they described themselves as peripheral to the city. And it was then in the, um, in the, there was another neighborhood that was in, it was similarly, um, there were similar characteristics and they started out the same way. They looked the same way, the same characteristics. And at the, the part of what I enjoyed about doing in-depth interviews was asking about changes over time. And people actually said, well, you know, nobody would even know we were a citizen of India back then and described themselves previously as peripheral. And now that they'd received these, this recognition and these resources, they, they were saying, well, now we can show like, we are citizens of Bangalore. We have the right, or they need to be providing things for us. And so this, this even self-description I found fascinating, the difference in that. Um, but I also think that there's a huge, you know, there's huge misconceptions about who lives in slums and whether or not they're migrants and whether or not they, they are um, planning to remain in the city for a long time, which I think policymakers can take as an as an excuse to not necessarily serve these neighborhoods because they're not only are these are slums undercounted, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions that they're very transient. They're gonna convert into non-slum areas eventually, that this is all just a temporary thing. And you can, you know, there's all this old literature that Professor Chatterjee also mentioned that um, there's this, you know, old literature from from the World Bank and but others as well that said slums are temporary and actually the present you know Ed Glazer also says the presence of at one point said the presence of slums today bodes well for growth tomorrow because it means that the city's developing and you know the research is just not bearing that out we see instead that residents live in slums for multiple generations and experience very little upward mobility and then are constantly or consistently pulled down with downward shocks as well and so I think when when first of all when the data say that there are fewer slums than there actually are and when there are conceptions misconceptions that people are living there temporarily and perhaps have some village to go back to or want to go back to then it's uh I think easier for them to turn turn an eye and so I think um I just wanted to reflect on that, I guess, because I think that's that's um, there. I just think there are a lot of misconceptions about how temporary they are, and they are indeed urban citizens who want to stay there and need these resources. Um, let's see. I think again, there were so many good points, but I've already babbled on and on. Um, I wanted to touch. I do want to make sure to touch on a couple more, though. Um, so then, so then another point was on the importance of state politics and what happens when you have uh, smart cities plans coming in. And I actually wanted to touch on that because, um, or and this idea that the shocks are going to become more frequent and deeper. And um, I did want to reflect on what I've seen on that in Patna, which is that we've surveyed. 43 slums in Patna in 2016. And at the time, like I said, very weak property rights, but most people didn't feel very concerned about eviction. Then prior to the pandemic starting, I guess 2018, 2019, was returning to, to these spaces and everyone was worried about eviction. And so the rhetoric then in every place that I revisited was smart cities, smart cities, smart cities, people are getting evicted. It's only a matter of time until they come to evict us. Now, when that happened, we real we realized, well, so when that happened, we started following up with the leaders there and, and checking on whether or not they'd been evicted and we're planning on going and, and um, following up. Before the pandemic started, 23 or about 25% of our sample had been evicted, had been displaced. And so we were going to then go follow up and see where have they gone and such, but then the pandemic started and I have not been to India since the pandemic began, but we have been calling the area leaders and actually, despite concerns that evictions would continue to happen during the pandemic or even ramp up, we we actually did see a pause in Putna, at least in our sample. And so I just flag that to say yes, 
slum residents were talking about the smart cities plan they were concerned about the smart cities plan and that's something that we're going to continue to study further to try and get at well what are the political determinants or what are the characteristics from our baseline data of which ones ended up getting evicted or not and can we see anything with that with the local um, political networks or is this just going to turn into a state story and there's not necessarily systematic predictors of which areas get evicted so that is something that if you're interested stay tuned i'm working on um, let's see. And then the last, I, the last thing I think I'll touch on is this question about where land developers figure into this. And so, yeah, I think, I think relatedly, that's, that's a really good point. And that's not something that I've considered explicitly. And that's more something that I'm thinking about now when we're thinking about smart cities and stuff and such. But, um, that is something that when I'm looking at, um, how people are engaging, I'm not considering whether or not land development figures into that. I do suspect it'll figure into which neighborhoods receive benefits. And so part of what we're looking at with Putna too is the land value of the areas that are getting evicted or not. But that's something that was, you know, still deserves more attention. I think I'll stop there. Uh, no, well, thank you. So you have almost covered almost all the questions and comments which have been raised by our discussions and panels. And I'm just saying uh, uh, that Dr. Ratula Kundu has joined this panel. So, well, thank you for joining uh, Dr. Ratula. She is associated with the Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai. So if you want to, uh, please come in and uh, share some of your comments, please. It's over to you, Dr. Ratula. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shomadeep, and thank you, Emily. That's a fascinating presentation, I said. And, you know, to all the panelists there, uh, I, I don't want to sort of bring up any more complexities because I think, you know, it was quite a rich uh, presentation, uh, but it does strike me, Emily, as, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk around uh, this idea of vote bank politics, this kind of patron-client relationship uh, that you sort of seem to sense. Now, beyond that, you know, what are these negotiations really about? Is it... You know, uh, so I would really like it if, you know, at some point in your work, you can sort of shed some light on the nature of negotiations, because it seems to me that uh, in some way, you know, uh, because of the graph, uh, everything is kind of moving towards formalization, whereas I would say that, you know, um, a lot many uh, of these negotiations might not end up uh, with uh, formalization, they might actually get into a, a kind of a, a sticky situation where mm -hmm. nothing really happens over years mm -hmm. and years of negotiations. So, you know, just keeping in mind that graph, it's kind of giving off that sense that, you know, mm -hmm. things move in that direction, but it may not. And mm -hmm. so just to keep that in mind, how do you keep that in play? when you think of the different kinds of negotiations that happen and who the different actors are involved. So just to, just to leave that there, I, mm. I'm not expecting an answer, but you know, this came up while you were describing it. But anyway, um, kudos to you for having covered so much ground and just adds to, contributes to all the work that uh, we, my fellow panelists and colleagues mm -hmm. at one point of time have talked about, so mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pratula. So, and if, uh, yes, again, it's uh, Dr. Emily, if you want to respond very briefly. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I think that that is an important point and I don't want to give off in any sense that there's an automatic conversion over time into this completely formal area because, or into these completely formal areas because most of the time there's not. Um, what and at least in the paper version, what I try to make clear is this is what I'm expecting at a given point in time. So at a given point in time, there will be these different neighborhood characteristics, and depending on where where that or de depending on the characteristics at that point in time, I expect different behaviors. I'm working on a book project in the longer term where I'm trying then to unpack why do some settlements get set off on a virtuous sort of cycle versus a vicious stuck cycle, because that absolutely happens. And we very rarely see slums converting into completely formal areas. And so I do think that there's going to be a pretty, I do think there's quite a bit of a drop off at some point, because at some point, 
So, be, I mean, politicians have incentives to uh, be providing to someone in formal spaces because they actually are trying to promote this dependency. And informal leaders as well benefit from having the power of be, you know, engaging in these negotiations. So at some point, there's actually some, I think, perverse incentives around um, moving beyond that kind of the, the last, not even the last mile, maybe the last 10 miles of the, uh, you know, of that spectrum, but discussing those dynamics, I'm glad you flagged, is important and is something that I'm working on unpacking. And I want to, I'll probably, I'll try to make clearer going forward when I present that, that that's a cross-sectional graph and that much more work is needed to understand who gets, you know, what sets these trajectories in motion and how do you get from one on one path it's also to possibly, you know, contingent on spatio-temporal dynamics, mm -hmm. because at particular points, particular coalitions might work, and particular spaces are valued versus not so valued. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those kind of characteristics, when they come into play, um, it's that contingency factor that plays in. So it's it's hard to mm -hmm. sort of you know, pin down exactly, you know, what mm -hmm. works and what doesn't work. Dharavi mm -hmm. itself, I think Diza's book says, you know, the durability of the slum mm -hmm. <laughs> belies every kind of effort to sort of redevelop it and, you know, mm -hmm. um, every attempt at redeveloping it over the last 10, 15 years. But then mm -hmm. it's also to do with the kind of market dynamics that plays mm -hmm. out in Mumbai, which may not be uh, similar to other cities. So, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I think that's that's a really great, it's a really great point. So, well, thank you. And now just uh, let me invite uh, the MP director, Arjun, uh, for your comments. It's so Sir, I would say we can yes. go to the way forward round. Uh, one, one minute to each of the panelists. I just yes. wanted to add a few things we missed that, uh, uh, Eminem, how do you see the role of technology? As had has been, you know, uh, practiced over the world, and you are also using satellite image, imagery. So, how do you see that? Uh, uh, what we can use to improve our slums or relocate them? And one of the most important part was the rental housing in the slums also, because there there is some migrant issue is coming, and then some kind of you know shadow and other things. And for this improvement, there is also a lot of gestation period, and it takes you know a lot of time and business as usual. Do you have any way forward for Indian cities to come over this illness in, in our urban domain? And uh, some policy related matters, but uh, everyone knows that we have Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban, in that the, the slum component is really a very meager, 5% only houses. We have sanctioned more than 10, 11 million houses. Uh, so those things let us leave, but uh, now let us move to way forward round. Yeah. So that we cover, who would like to go first? Samad Deep said, Yeah, part. Professor, no, Professor Chatterjee. Uh, uh, if, uh, yes. Mahalia, ma'am, yes. Uh, about. Uh, one, uh, one minute, Mohanadi. Uh, no, no, actually, what I want to say that this is a very interesting thing, and many things can be brought in if a research is done. Uh, one can, of course, look into the. Uh, uh, of the state's initiative and other things. Uh, and uh, as I have said, the gendered component and the, everything can be brought into in this uh, very important uh, thing. And uh, another point is about informality that uh, as uh, this in our system, it takes a long time. It's a long time to formalize anything, including the slums. One should keep uh, in mind in that. Uh, and shall I respond to Arvind's comment that West Bengal is oh, um, way back in giving land title? Uh, no, ma'am. It will take it will take much okay, more time. Okay, so okay, well, well. Okay, okay Arvind. We, we will have we will have another panel on that. Yes, sure. <laughs> okay, okay. So thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Mohanadi, for your comments. And now uh, let me move over to uh, Dr. Jinia uh, for your uh, comments. Maybe a brief, one or two minutes. Yes, I think uh, like uh, thanks Emily uh, for this uh, presentation really and this work because I was just checking your articles and uh, I, I find your article uh, recently, I think in 2019, published in uh, Environment and Urbanization. Very, very interesting. I think uh, like again, the way you have put the methodology section and uh, the way you have counted the slum scores 
So I'm quite fascinated with your uh, methodology, methods methodology approach. So uh, I think like uh, my suggestion would be, as Ratula also mentioned about uh, some works by uh, Roy and Onuna Roy, and also like mm -hmm. why it is important to decouple, you know, some form uh, informally because the whole lot of uh, uh, discussion is going on uh, in that linear di direction. So how to insert uh, more li non linearities and complexities, you know, in this entire understanding. So uh, and I don't know, I'm not sure, but whether you know uh, it will be more fruitful for you if you can also complement your uh, methodology uh, with qualitative insights. Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, you know that that project ecologists or for that matter uh, other urban uh, scholars uh, had used or are still using yeah. so yeah thank you thank you dr genia now uh, it's uh, over to mr arvin are you there oh yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm there uh, nothing much to I think you are not audible, Arvind. Uh, is there any it's network so... issue? Network issue? Yes, I think uh, Arvind's video, of course. We can okay. move to the next. Okay, so uh, it's uh, Dr. Sharani. Yeah. Uh, actually, just wanted to say one thing only that you said these three cities are very different. I mean, this is. I think it's a positive thing as we, if you want to look forward, that not only these three cities, the entire, it's very heterogeneous and diverse cyber urbanization we have. And that is a very positive thing. I mean, uh, even though there are policies, like our missions like JNURM or smart city mission, where we are trying to homogenize and show urbanization as a very homogenized process, it's a very good thing that we still have that kind of diverse fact where the every cities are different even within cities there are certain form there are so much differences so uh, mm -hmm. to me as long as this kind of differences are diverse their diversity in urbanization is there and it is also good for us our researchers we have got much more better prospect for working on those things so that is mm -hmm. the only thing but thank you thanks 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 for mm -hmm. dr sharani and uh, dr rotula if you again want to add something uh, very Nothing much to add. I look forward to her papers. And, uh, you know, really one of the best things about this is how you position um, agency. Um, and you um, and it's clearly within the negotiated nature of agency of slum dwellers. And, uh, and what would be really nice to know is when that works, when that falls apart, um, how and under what conditions that really uh, makes a difference in their lives. Uh, so it would be really nice to read up. So all the best on your future endeavors. Right. Thank you. Arvind is back. Arvind, okay. yeah. last, last comment was that uh, <laughs> love the research. Uh, sorry <laughs> that I uh, ended up uh, could, not be, uh, could not comment. So love the research. I think uh, more inquiry on, on the, 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 the qualitative aspects which you mentioned that you're doing or are doing, have done in Patna. I think we'll look forward to that and, and, uh, and would love to kind of read upon that. That's it. Congrats for the work Yes, thank you. Thank you, Abhinan. Actually, we started this uh, panel with a 75 minutes duration, but already we have <laughs> <laughs> nine past two and many issues are coming. So I think we need another uh, couple, not one panel, another couple of panels to uh, deliberate on all those uh, intricate issues. And uh, as I have seen that uh, this informal governance, uh, whatever in India in practice is in stark contrast to the uh, formal governance regimes in India. So, but mm. uh, but there is very scant, or rather, I should say, the non acknowledgement of such informal aspects, which have resulted in some sort of cosmetic si changes in the situation only. And this does not uh, work well for the reduction in the vulnerabilities and increase in resilience of the cities in the near future. So, 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 what is think? So, what I, I think that there is an imperative to to recognize the integral relationship and the contribution of slums and the informal settlements and economy to the nature of urbanized urbanism, which India has been experiencing. And then uh, serious attempts uh, should be made to understand the conditions of life and how to redress those vulnerabilities of the settlements. So we need a lot more research, a lot more panel discussions on this. And uh, I'm hopeful that IMPRI will continue to do these sorts of panel discussion to say it uh, much more light on unraveling this black box of informalities of the uh, Indian urban governance system and Indian urban planning system. 
So uh, with this, let me now uh, 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 request uh, Dr. Arjun to formally propose our uh, the vote of thanks. Or some last word to Emily, ma'am. Would you oh, like to add anything? Would you like to add anything? Sure. So I, I just wanted to say thanks again for um, for everything. But also, I'm happy that there's been several people in the in the last round uh, express interest in the qualitative work as well, because that's something that uh, that I'm really, you know, relying on heavily in this discussion of, of uh, you know, how do slum residents talk about their own agency and 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 their what do these characteristics mean for their beliefs about their own citizenship? And so I'm actually relying quite heavily on the on the qualitative uh, bit in things that will be coming out going forward. So I'm happy to hear that that people want to see that. <laughs> um, I was at, so Dr. Kumar, you ask um, you asked about what what how, how can we use technology going forward? And I just want to note that I do, I do think that there are some important applications for technology. So, so one is that um, you, you know, there was discussion of environmental justice issues. And I know that some people are using GIS to map more environmentally hazardous areas. And that is there are more environmentally vulnerable areas. And that is where you're more likely to see slum residents coming up uh, or slums coming up. And so I think that using shape files or GIS, uh, yeah, yeah. So that these tools can be used to identify potentially vulnerable spaces where we might see slums coming up, but also then think about what's gonna happen with, with changes going forward with climate change. I know that there's, there's quite a bit of um, interest in that, that people are using technology to, to look at some of these aspects of vulnerability. Um, one way that I wanna use technology going forward is, um, looking at changes over time. So it's very hard, you know, we have a bunch of survey data now that captures cross sections, but because we can see these physical deprivations in uh, urban, at least in some urban areas or in some slum areas from the satellite images, then because Google Earth shows 20 years of, of images, we can sort of, we could then look more pretty systematically at development trajectories. So one thing that I'm gonna be trying to look at is at least with the sample I've already created, um, you know, how can I leverage that free imagery over time to look at how things have been changing? So, so I just wanted to touch on those, those questions. Um, and actually, I guess I'll, I'll just leave it there. This was uh, a really fun discussion and I'm, I'm really happy to have met all the panelists and look forward to staying in touch about all of this. Great. And we also did some work with uh, Dr. Abhinav Alakshendra, you must be knowing. We got a grant from International Growth Center. So for mm. Patna, we have done uh, a lot of those study. I will share with you. So nonetheless, yeah, please. yes. Samia Dipsar, would you like to propose a vote of thanks? Yes. Samia Dipsar? Well, Arjun, you please propose. OK, thank you. So thank you, everyone, for joining this very uh, interesting deliberation today under our series, The State of Cities, Hashtag City Conversation, organized by IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban, and Regional Studies. And uh, today's deliberation, very important. And so, so uh, we almost crossed our time by so much on negotiating informality, a range of policy needs, and problem-solving strategies in urban slums. And we really focused on India today. And our speaker for today, Dr. Emily Rens, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for bearing with us and an excellent uh, lecture of yours. I'm also thankful to all of our discussants, Professor Mahalia, ma'am, uh, Dr. Jenia, ma'am, Dr. Salini, ma'am, uh, uh, Arvind, of course, uh, also uh, supporting us in all our urban works and uh, all our other, uh, Ratula, ma'am, also, and all of our participants who were here on Zoom and who uh, I mean, were watching at Facebook Live and would later watch at YouTube and our other podcast. And thank you, uh, all, all of you. And also thank you, uh, Swamit Dev, sir, and Impri team. And I wish you a very nice day and good evening to everyone here in India. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. And good day, Dr. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Yes.